In order to live an extraordinary and abundant life, you must focus on your internal battle and win within. My name is Randy Wilson, and welcome to the Rich Mind Podcast. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Rich Mind Podcast. And today, super excited about the conversation we are about ready to get into here with Ingo Schulmeier. We actually were just discussing some things here before we hit record and some of the things that he has done as far as his experiences in his corporate life. And then he's uh, done some different things in his personal life as well, which has led him to being in a a location that might surprise you, which is going to be a lot of fun. This is going to be a great conversation, but a little bit about Ingo. Ingo is a former Simid. Ingo is a former semiconductor executive. He's now turned himself into to a transformational growth coach. He's a dreamer, a doer. He considers himself a free spirit. He's a successful family man with a beautiful wife and two incredible boys. He's a six-time competitor in the Ironman events. And if anybody's familiar with Ironman, I was telling him before we hit record, my son actually competed in a half Ironman, but he's competed in six. And he actually qualified for the uh, the world event, the world championship event, which held, took place in Hawaii. So I hope to dig into that a little bit as well. He's passionate about helping others find their true self, which we will get into that, what that means and how we can help you discover who you're true self is as well. He's also a fellow podcaster and his podcast is called The Small Reset. And that title is intriguing as well. I'm curious about what that, where that came from. Uh, Just get into a little bit more detail about that as well, but The Small Reset for his podcast. And we'll talk about that as we go along in the conversation. But without further ado, Ingo, welcome to the show, man. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Yes. Thanks, Randy. I like your introduction. Thanks for having me here. Appreciate that. Yeah, this is going to be a fun conversation. So I went through a lot of the bullet point lists. I usually try to take a few of the things that I can discover about the guest, but I'm always curious to go a little bit deeper inside of some of those stories. I mentioned that you were a corporate executive turned uh, entrepreneur. I would love for you to unpack that and give everybody out there, the listeners, a little bit more about yourself. Tell them kind of where you were, where you are, and kind of where you see where you see yourself headed. Mm-hmm. Sure, I can do that. So, yeah. So, so, so let's start early. So, I started my career, I would say, normally, right? So, so um, I grew up in Germany, and then I went to university, and I did my engineering degrees, and I started a, started a corporate career, and I I was very driven by my goals, right? I was always like, I wanted to have be successful, whatever that meant to me at that time, right? <laughs> and, and and I had these dreams of, yeah traveling the world and everything and, and doing all kinds of interesting things. And yeah, so I was working in, in, the, in my company for more than 15 years or different kind of companies actually. And I, I always achieved my goals or most of the times I achieved my goals that I set to myself, but it didn't really fulfill me, right? It didn't really give me everything. I mean, so um, yeah, and then we... After many years, so so like now in 2021, um, me and my family decided we we make a cut. So we did something very blunt, right? For, for most people, it's it's a very radical decision, but for us, I think it was a, a great decision. And since then, I didn't regret it. So um, we left our house, we we left our jobs, we sold everything, and we took the family and our two dogs, and we moved to Mexico. And we thought, okay, let's try something out. Let's try something new and let's go for an adventure and let's see if we find something better there. And that's what we did. And we didn't actually have really big plans where we want to end up or how it should look like this life, right? So we, we just went here. We, we bought a car here in Mexico City and we we started traveling. So for nine months, we were traveling around here, um, all over Mexico. And that was also a very exciting time. So also for my kids, I think. Um, I think it's also difficult, right, for people to decide whether to do that. I mean, if you're alone, it's one thing, but if you have, like, uh, two two kids that are growing up and, and, and a wife, so that's, uh, you need to actually decide for four people, so it's even getting more difficult. But I think it, it was great, and I think in this almost one year on the street and, and uh, yeah, on the road, uh, the kids... I would say they learned more than in a few years in school because they, they learn, learn so much about life and they, they're fluent now in Spanish and everything. And 
yeah, and then after nine months, we, we reached to some small city here and somehow we didn't feel like traveling anymore. And uh, after a few days, we said, I mean, we put the kids here to a small alternative school, which was mainly outside in the nature and everything. It was also the time of the pandemic, right? So we were also in, in our home a lot, lot changed before. So we were just at home and with the Zoom meetings all day and, you know, a lot of things changed. And and then we found this place here and after a few days we said, okay, we're staying. So, and, and since then we're here and we're building our new life here, right? So meanwhile, we bought like a, a small land here and we're build, building our house right now. And yeah, that's how we ended up here. And I wouldn't say it's the end of the story, right? I, I don't know where I will be in like three or five years, right? It's just like <laughs> the next uh, chapter of our life. That's where it's super interesting for me. I said when I first discovered who you were and started learning more about you, for your ability to make that type of a decision, basically uproot your family. And so you said you were from Germany. Were you in Germany at the time when you made the decision to leave? No. So actually, the last three years before we came to Mexico, we lived in Israel. I had a job Israel. in Israel for, from 2019 yes, to 22. We lived in Israel. Okay. I was so working you... for a company there. Yeah. So you had a corporate job on the outside. You probably looked like you were super successful, right? Had the the job, the stuff, the cars, the houses and stuff, but you just said the word that you used, you just weren't fulfilled. Can you go into a little bit more detail about kind of what that feeling was? I think there might be a lot of folks out there even today that are kind of stuck, kind of stuck in their day-to-day grind, uh, whether it's a job, whether it's any type of experience that they're just not fulfilled. I love that word. Can you describe what that feeling was that you had at the moment and uh, maybe just help some folks maybe discover maybe what that is for themselves? Right. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very good question, actually. So, yeah, I mean, I didn't, I mean, I enjoyed my job most of the time. I mean, like every job you have better and, and, and worse. But in general, I would say I liked my job. But I think there was some element missing. And for many years, probably I didn't know what it was. Maybe it was some purpose or something. And I also thought for many years I wanted to do something different and, and I thought to make this move to, to like building my own business or something like that. But that's a very hard decision to make because if you're used for so many years uh, to get your monthly paycheck, right? It's like you, I also had my limiting beliefs, right? I thought, I know I cannot quit my job because then I, at the end of the month I, I don't have the money anymore and I can't feed my children anymore and, and you know, all this stuff. So um i think i was it, it was a long mind process it was not was not that from one day to the other i decided it right it was over many years that developed that and then yeah i think with the with the pandemic where also my job changed that i had before i was also traveling a lot uh i was a lot in the united states and, and in asia but then i suddenly was sitting all day in front of this two had these two meetings and then after a few months <laughs> it was just enough for me so i didn't I said, okay, that's, that's it. Let's, let's try something uh, different. So it's, yes, I remember that time frame. I wasn't working in the corporate world at that moment, but at, at the same time, any communication that I had over Zoom was just, it was just, it was tough. So those of you that were doing it all the time, uh, every day, probably almost, I don't want to say all day, but a, a lot of the day, right? You were spending your time on Zoom. I can only imagine how draining that was, which led you then to make this decision, or at least you said it was building up over a few years, few months, right? Before you kind of, we went through the pandemic and you kind of had this moment for yourself. Take us back to when you finally made that decision. Was it something that you sat down with your wife and said, okay, I've got to make a change. This isn't working. Or was it more of a, yeah, just curious kind of how even that, that transpired in that moment with your wife? Yes, yeah, of course, we discussed this for a while with my wife, especially. I mean, the kids were also in a... I think we catched it in a good age of the kids because at, at this time they were like uh, 9 and 11, right? So I, I think that's still a time where you can take them out of their like uh, social structures. I think if they're a little bit older, now they're teenagers. Now they don't want to go anywhere anymore <laughs> with their parents, right? So it, it was also a good time that for, for the kids. And yeah, of course, we discussed. And actually, I told you before we, we started recording, right? Actually, my wife was pushing me also a little bit. She wanted to do, do traveling. And 
we we also like traveling, right? We we met actually in India like uh, almost twenty years ago now, where we were both backpacking for half a year during our our studies. So we were traveling there, and my wife always said, oh, "Let's do again uh, 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 some travel, right? Some journey." And I always said, "No, no, I have my job. I cannot my career and everything. It's not possible. I cannot do that." And yeah, this time then, yeah, all, all the points came together and, and, and we just said we, we do it. And I think the the point that made it easier was that we thought, I mean, as I told you before, right, I thought always, yeah, I can I cannot quit my job. I won't have money anymore. It's, you know, like if it's not working, what are we doing? But then we changed also the mindset and we, we changed the perspective or I changed the perspective a little bit and we said, okay, what's the worst thing that can happen, right? So, so we said, okay, we go traveling for one year. And if it's not working, if we don't like it in one year, we can still go back and look for a new job and, and do the same thing again, right? I mean, maybe in a different job. And so, and then the worst thing that happens is we just went for a one-year vacation. And if you just, that's that's a good example how 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 it matters if you change your perspective, right? From a something, oh, I, I whatever, it's horrible. I can I don't have money for my kids anymore. To okay, I go for a one-year vacation. If it's not working, I look for a new job and. It, it, it's completely different uh, mindset, right? And it's a completely different um, perspective, right? It gives you much more possibility and much more yeah, opportunity. Which opened you up to have, so far, a great experience, it sounds like, right? From what I'm hearing based on what the research I've done and then obviously the little bit of discussion that we've had, it's been a fantastic experience. So good for you. So it sounds like your wife was on board, which congratulations on that. I think some of us, uh, I've been married on, uh, 28 years coming up. I'd be curious, how long have you been married? Uh, we were married since, uh, I told you, we met like 19 years ago. It was 2005, okay. yeah. And, and we were married three years later. So we are 16 years. With, okay. So it's not uh, like you were, 16 years it's we were not married like you just years. were married just recently, right? So you've been married no, some, no, no. quite some time, <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I guess where I was going with that, that thought was that sometimes I think that we, uh, our spouse or our partners, right, may not go along with what we, exactly the visions that we have for ourselves or for our lives. And that's super cool that she's been on board with you from the very beginning. So congratulations on that. My wife has been very supportive of me and the ventures that I've always done different, weird, not necessarily moved halfway across the world. You know, you know what I mean? The, the extreme things that you've done. So congratulations on that, but definitely been supportive of me as well. So what then, as far as the decision to go to Mexico, where did, where did that kind of fall into play as far as when you're trying to decide, you know, where are we going to go? Cause uh, I believe you said you basically sold everything you had as far as most of your physical possessions that you had and just went on the road. Basically what led you to then decide to go to Mexico first? Yeah, was, I mean, we saw that there were a few options we had uh, or, or that we considered right there. Uh, um, in the end, we decided for Mexico because we we liked the country. We, we also had uh, some friends there or still have friends there. And we thought it's a big country, right? You have all the possibilities, basically. And I mean, there were some other like uh, Latin American countries, but um, we didn't want to focus only like on a... I mean, we, we're not the people that are uh, sitting on the tropical beach all day and, and, and you know, with the laptop and the Caipirinha and, and uh, working on the beach. So... We also like the mountains and, and we don't like it so hot. So we said, Mexico, which can try everything. It's a big country, you have a lot of opportunities. It's uh, somehow central, it's uh, Spanish speaking. So um, it's easy to learn the language. And yeah, so, so, and the immigration process was more or less easy. So let's get into that. Yeah, just out of curiosity, that was something. I'm glad you said that because that was a question I had in my mind. And so the immigration process, how does take us through that? How does that work? Obviously, you weren't from there, and as I, I assume your your wife didn't have, didn't have residency there as well. How how does that work? How does that work when you make a decision to go somewhere on vacation? Is different than obviously you're you've, you're building. You're starting to build your life there, right? So yeah, just can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So, so that was also a, a consideration, right? We we didn't just want to. I mean, we thought we want to go traveling, but we're not like the typical typical digital nomads that we're saying, okay, we want to live one month here in this country, and the next month we will be in the different country. We still went with the idea or with the with with the goal to to settle somewhere, right? So, 
immigration process was important for us because many countries they have this uh, short term visas or like this this residencies like in Mexico you can stay for example six months and then you have to leave the country so many like uh, younger or, or more flexible uh, let's say single single uh, uh, people they just stay here for a few months and then they go out for 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 a few weeks and then they come back in again or they travel somewhere else. Uh, but we wanted to, also with the idea that we want to eventually buy some property here, which we did then also, um, you need to to look on residency. And that's not everywhere the same process, right? So uh, in Mexico, you had to, there are different ways to do that. I mean, either you have uh, need to have relatives here. Uh, in our case, it was based, it's called based on financial solvency. So you just need to prove that you have some certain income or certain savings and, and then they give you like a temporary residency for four years and, and after four years you can get a permanent residency interesting so, yeah that was why it was for us it was was the best option actually and you intend to stay there because from what i understand you said you're building a house you're getting ready to move in right yeah yeah so we, cool. we bought a property here we, we're building a house right now and uh, yeah, hopefully in Two, three months, we'll move in. That's why I have all the mess here in my bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's super cool. Getting ready to move. Those of us that have moved, we understand how that is. So let's talk about how your kids have transitioned as far as like the language barriers. And you said that they've kind of taken it on, almost like soaked it up like a sponge. How has that been for them, the transition from where they were? You said they were like nine, 10 years old when you started the process to where they are now. You said now they're teenagers. Yeah, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so I mean, with, I must say our kids are incredible. It's it was really amazing how they how they adapted, how they're flexible. I mean, we moved already before one time, right? We moved from lived in Germany. They grew up in Germany, and then we moved to Israel for three years, and they were all so very supportive. I mean, sure, when we when we said okay, well, let's go to Mexico, of course they were like a little sad and and they were worried about their friends, but they were also kind of open-minded and I would say they they really enjoyed the life here and they adapted very quickly in terms of language I mean kids they, they learn so quickly right for me it's, it's more difficult I mean I, meanwhile I also speak uh, uh, decent Spanish but uh, for the kids it was so easy so they picked up already when we were traveling in this nine months on the street they just picked stuff up and then but then uh, like now September 22 i think yeah, two years ago we put them in the school here and after the first day they, they, they came back home and they said okay we'll stay here they, they liked it so much they just said they will stay and they didn't speak good spanish that by then right but then when they went to the school and, and they were exposed to spanish all day a few hours or every day a few hours for a few hours um they they, they picked it up so quickly and they're so happy here now and, and they have their friends and they have um, um yeah, they have everything. That's why, why I told you before, I mean, we, we didn't decide we stay forever, but I think for now, at least till the kids are old enough that they go their own ways. So we will stay here, which is whatever, the next five or seven years or so. And that's our next uh, horizon for planning, right? So so plan is to stay, stay at least for this time here. Sounds good. And then if you choose to make a different decision, it sounds like you're pretty good at making those decisions and, and taking different action, which is <laughs> something you'll definitely be able to do based on your experience or that what you've done so far to get you to where you are today. Yeah, I mean, that, that's an interesting point. You're saying we're good in decision, but I think the, 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 the point is just to make a decision, right? Uh, many people j just don't make decisions, right? They, because they're, they're afraid of the consequences of their decision. But for us, that's why I'm saying the decision is not forever, right? I mean, if the, if I make a decision and I figure out it was a bad decision, which also happens, uh, okay, I, I have to. It's in my hands to change it again, right? But if I never make a decision, I will, <laughs> I will just stay where I am, right? So I think it's yeah. For for me, it's I usually make quick decisions and then I stick to that. And if then you can adjust on the way or or, or change it if it just doesn't work. So let's unpack that a little bit because I, I firmly believe that as well, right? Meaning the ability to make decisions quickly, get a result. So I think a lot of times people will put meaning on the result, call it good, call it bad, when in reality, it's just a result. And then you can make a different decision based on 
the feelings or what you get back from that, that result. Does that make any sense? Kind of where I'm going with that. Can you unpack that as far as, has that been a, a mental muscle that you've built for yourself, the ability to make those decisions as you've come along in your adulthood or where did that come from? Cause I believe that making those decisions is super powerful, right? Uh, to be able to get people to move forward to this life that they would really like, but that lack of decision-making is such a, a hangup for folks. Yes, I, I think that's a very interesting question. And I think yeah, that's something I was building over many years and also something I probably might change. I changed also my perspective on. And we talked before about, I mean, I was always good in goal setting, right? And I always had my goals and I was very focused in achieving that, which is also kind of a decision, right? I, I decided, okay, I have this goal. I will achieve that no matter what, right? It was, if it was a priority for me, I, I will get there, right? Um, and that was one part what I find out is what I changed my mind on is my, uh, my view on goals, right? I still think goals are very important, but I don't think it's important to necessarily achieve them. I think they're very important as a, let's say a lighthouse or some, you know, some guiding light that shows you more or less the direction where you want to go. But, um, what I find out is when I achieve the goals, yeah, you're happy for a day or so, but then what's happening, you just need to have the next goal, right? So <laughs> you want to say, okay, what's next? Like, like it was the same with the Ironman, right? I did this Ironman for, for many years and I was always getting better. And in the end, I went to the world championship. I said, what's next? Ah, after the world championship, just not much more, right? So you you need to do something else. And, <laughs> and yeah, yeah, so I think, Goal setting is important, but I think what is much more important is the process to the goal and that you're that you're constantly in action, right? That that you focus on every day and that every day you're trying to, to give your best. And whether you change in six months your goal or something like that, it's not so it's not so important. As long as you're constantly working on yourself and improving yourself. Um I, and so I would today I, I value the process and action much more than the, the result, if that makes sense. So you said, you, no, it does. It does to me. So I was trying to think of how I want to kind of uh, return what I'm hearing and thinking back to you, right? So that way, obviously, we can go a little bit deeper into that. So you mentioned that it was a more of a like a, a guidepost or a, a lighthouse, right? Something to aspire towards, but not get so hung up on the end result. Is that basically what I'm hearing as far as uh, you can have a vision have an idea, have an aspiration for something or some uh, type of a result, but not being so caught up on the outcome that it detracts you from enjoying the process along the way. Is that is that basically what I'm hearing you say? Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, have your goals and have your, especially the long-term goals, like, right, the, the, there's the vision, but um, yeah, vision also changes over the years. So don't, I mean... It, it's guiding you and should should more or less guide you in the right direction, but um, yeah, if you have to change it, you change it. You don't stick to it if you, if you don't if you see it doesn't align anymore. And, and the other thing is also, I mean, people are sometimes afraid of setting goals, and then they tend to set the goals too low, right? Because they say I, I have to achieve the goal, so I set the goal that I certainly can achieve, but that's. That doesn't help them to grow as much as they could. That doesn't help them to get to their full potential, right? So, so usually it's better if if your goal is bigger, and um, than to and, and then to achieve it maybe ninety percent than to have a very small goal and, and and to always achieve it, right? Love that. So, speaking of goals and speaking of achievement. Let's pivot into talking a little bit more about your Ironman experience. You you mentioned that there just a second ago. Talk about how how that process was, how, where did you discover your ability to, so if anybody, are, if people are familiar with it or not, obviously you can film them in as far as more of the details, but it's a, it's a swimming, it's a biking and a running competition basically. And it's long distance. <laughs> and I'll let you kind of fill in the gaps as far as how long it takes to compete in Ironman. But let's go into that a little bit. Talk about how that experience, I mentioned at the very beginning, you were a six-time competitor in Ironmans and obviously competed and uh, qualified for the uh, world championship, which is congratulations. That's a huge accomplishment. Talk about your Ironman experience, kind of what you've learned from that. We talked about goals um, 
and maybe how you've kind of learned how to, to pivot yourself within the, the, uh, the task of trying to get yourself physically ready for that type of an event of an event. Mm. Yeah. So that was also something that happened, of course, not in one year, but over many years, right. And it's also some, maybe some nice example for evolving goals. So I was, I was always, I like to do endurance sports and I like to do the outside in the nature. I always like to run and cycle. And then it started. And before already, like in 2000 to 2005, I was doing also like uh, uh, cycling races mainly in the Alps, for example, so long distance cycling races. Um, and then in, I think it was in 2007 or something. Yeah, in 2007, I decided, okay, I want to do an, uh, triathlon and because I don't like short distances because it's too, I, yeah, I, I prefer the long distances because it's more relaxed, right? So you, you don't have to run so fast and everything. So, um, yeah, I decided to do an Ironman at this time. I couldn't really swim. I mean, I could swim somehow, but not really like, a, a, like freestyle, um, crawl or something like that. So I just signed up for an Ironman event one year later and I decided, okay, so so I have one year to to learn swimming, and then I went like over the winter. I went every year in the or every day in the university pool, and I started learning swimming. And then I did my first Ironman the year after, and then it was a little difficult, but uh, because yeah, you have a lot of experience there because it, it, it's a very long day and many things happen. And yeah, and then I wanted to get better in that, so I did another one the year after. Um, after that, I had a few year break because also because yeah we we we, we had kids and, and I started a job and everything right. Um, but then I think in 2014 I, I went back and yeah and 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 did Ironman again, and and I, and I love the competition because it's also yeah it it keeps you focused. For me, this long distance stuff is almost like meditation, right? Because I'm you're with yourself, you're in the nature, you're on your bike or or running, and yeah, you just focusing on your, your breathing and on your steps and you can be really with the nature. So it's, it's very, I, I really enjoyed it. You said, did you say it was like relaxing? I can't imagine, or, or you know, like almost like a meditative state. I can't imagine the, doing that. So let's put some, uh, some context as far as the, the distances, it's a long distance, but the distances for the three different parts of the race, can, can you tell us what those are? Yeah, the distances, um, I think in miles, it's something like 2.5 miles, 2.4 miles swimming. Um, then it's 112 miles cycling, and then it's 26 miles running, so a marathon. All in one day. This isn't like separate. Yeah, it's one <laughs> This day. isn't like, okay, you do one one day, you go on and no, do no, the no. next. No, it's all in one this day. is all in one day. Right. How long does that typically take you to compete? From start to finish, I assume you probably start early in the morning. How long does it typically do take you to get? Yeah, usually like that you start at seven. For me, for me, my best result was like nine hours thirty. The the world record is much better there. Like uh, I think the world record is now below eight hours, which is pretty fast. But uh, yeah, pretty nine fast. Hours nine hours is really pretty fast. Are you kidding me? That's I wouldn't be able to do one part of those sections in nine hours. Well, maybe a little bit more than nine hours. I don't know which, but yeah, that's super. That's super neat. Which you actually qualified then for the world championships uh, in Hawaii. Talk about that experience. Right. So, so um, as I said, so every year I was getting better and I was improving. Um, I like it also because it's uh, you know you have to work a lot on training on nutrition and and changing your yeah your training structure and everything fitted in your the rest of your life because it's also a lot of hours training and you have to be very consequent you have to be very disciplined and i think i mean if you're really preparing well for such an event it's it, it, it's actually not the event itself that is hard right because it's the but it's the many months like like usually 6 to 8 months of really focused preparation for this event where you know, you have to go out every day, right? Even in, in Germany in the winter when it's snowing, there's no, you cannot say, okay, I'm not going out. You still go out and, and right, there's, uh, it's raining like hell. It's cold. You still go out to train. So it, it, it trains also very good the mindset and also your your ability to, to, to schedule and everything. And yeah, I think if you're prepared well, the, the event itself is, is more like the, it's like the reward for, for all the hard <laughs> months that you had before 
I mean, it's still still a long day, but uh, yeah, I, I usually enjoyed my races. That's awesome. Congratulations on that as well. That's super big accomplishment. So folks are probably out there listening right now thinking, okay, Ingo, is, he's done so much. He lives in Mexico. Obviously, he traveled and moved all over the world. He's uh, super athletic. He's accomplished a lot. What is it that you're doing now? You, you've kind of turned yourself into almost like a digital nomad, right? You're, you're helping folks really discover their true selves. Is kind of how I, how I read it there at the very beginning. Uh, you help them find their true self, which I love that. Let's talk about a little bit more about how and what you're doing now as far as for work. I know you're not necessarily working for a corporation, but as an entrepreneur, you're out there trying to help people discover their true self and maybe figure out ways that they can start living um, you know, the life of their dreams. Let's talk about mm. that a little bit. Sure. Yeah, I, I think that's that's exactly what I'm doing. And, and I started to build my business two years ago as a, as a coach helping people exactly like I was a few years ago, right? Uh, many people are in the same situation. They're um, like, uh, they have their job, they have their house. They're, let's say, I wouldn't say in a in a perfect life, but it's more or less decent life, right? It's, it's so good that it's not enough painful to make changes, but also it doesn't really fulfill them. And I help them to start from there. And that doesn't necessarily mean that I recommend to any everyone to, to to just sell everything and, and, and quit their job and move to, to the other end of the world. I think that was my solution. But I think the important point is, I mean, I'm really working uh, on the psychological side of things and I'm working with them to find their solution, right? So so we it's a lot of talking. And there we also do exactly this, what we discussed earlier, uh, working on this limiting beliefs. Uh, limiting beliefs are usually something we have, from our early childhood or we carry just unconsciously around with us and um, yeah, and, and just find their own self. Yeah. I call it like that because um, we all think we, or let's say we all want to be successful. Right. And we all think we know what success is, but I think it's very, we're very, there are a lot of distraction and from all the social media and from all the, all our family and friends and, uh, all our society that that has this that gives us this image of of a successful life, right? But it's not always what what we for ourselves find out what real success is for ourselves, right? It can be something it doesn't have to, but it can be something very different from from what what is the let's say the general definition of success, and and that's what I usually work on with my clients. Yeah. I love that. And part of that, I believe you've got a framework that you use to help people kind of discover what some of those things are for themselves. That's for myself has been one of the greatest things that I've discovered for myself was that the ideas and the distractions, as you said, that I've been fed and to believe right within myself and my surroundings and everything that's going on in the world, they aren't necessarily the truth. They aren't true for me which gives me then the ability to make different decisions to then get better and different results, right? Which I love that. So that, that's what I'm hearing you say, then that's what you help your clients do as well. But I believe you've got a, a framework that you take them through to help them through that discovery phase. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that framework? That would be super cool. Sure. Yeah, so I did develop my own framework. It's based a little bit on NLP and other um, psychological tools. Um, I call it Release, Rediscover, Rise. And I usually start with release because that's what I think um, these are the things that are holding us back, right? We, we talked about before about dramas, about limiting beliefs, about yeah, about our internal value and belief system mainly. And this is the stuff, if we want to go somewhere, that's usually unconsciously things that are holding or dragging us back, right? So, uh, so if we work against these forces, it's very difficult to reach our goal. So that's why we, we, we go with first very deep in our past and we resolve that we overcome this limiting beliefs. Um, and from there, we go to the second step, which is rediscover. From there, we really look at the, again, at our vision. And, and then it's really like our vision and we, we develop that newly. And then you have these two forces, right? It's, it's, it's on the one thing, what our internal things, what holding us back and the, and the other thing, where we want to be, what, or what we want to be and in, in, in how we see, see our ideal self, our dream self, right? And only then, the last part is rise. This is where we start with the motivational work and we start to build a roadmap and we start to set goals and, and, and build habits to get there. And I, I think today many people are working only on this last part, right? We, we think, 
okay, we, we, we write down some goals or whatever. I want to be a millionaire next year or what, I want to have this other job or if I, have this, if I have a new wife, I will be happy. And we write this down. And so based on that, we're setting goals for next year, but it's, uh, it's just based on motivation. And then we're working against our internal forces uh, or it's not really aligned. And it's very difficult to maintain this motivation over a longer period of time. So another big part of your passion and things that you're involved with trying to help folks is through that process is your podcast, The Small Reset. I love that. I said that at the very beginning. I love that title. Uh, when I launched my podcast, I was trying to come up with a name and a title that I thought would resonate with as many folks as you possibly could, right? Based on on the message that you want to deliver. Talk a little bit about that, The Small Reset. And yeah, yeah. So we've been talking about goals. We've been talking about achievement, right? We've talked about how you've done so many different things, but the word small in that, that title is just, it's just kind of interesting. Cause I think a lot of people will think bigger, right? You've got to do more, be more, have more, all that stuff. I'm going to shut up now. I'd love for you to kind of take it from there. <laughs> Tell us where the, uh, where the small piece comes from as far as the, right. the title for your podcast. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, it's actually my podcast, but it's all my brand is, and my website is called the, the the Small Reset, right? And I came up with this idea because you know there is people talking about the Great Reset, right? Where they say, okay, we have to reset everything and go like degrowth and all, all this stuff. And, and I don't really resonate with this idea, so I thought, okay, that means that we have get some decisions made top down that tell us how to live our lives. So I thought, okay. It's much better to, if we're working on ourselves, because for me, I mean, the only person I can change actually is myself, right? And the only way to make this planet better is to change myself. And instead of doing this one great reset where we start then from zero, I thought it's much better if I work on myself and let's say every day or every day. So it's not one small reset. So I do a lot of small resets, right? On myself and um, yeah, working this way on myself. And let's say everyone would do that, so it would be much better, right? Because then we would, it would be more like a bottom-up approach to this, and we would all improve, not like a revolutionary shift. Uh, I think it's more important, yeah, to do this. Like, uh, let's say there's this like one percent per day rule, right? I don't know if it's one percent, but yeah, if we work every day on improving ourselves a little bit, and maybe give up bad habit or do something to make the place better, just like try to become a little bit better. I thought that's uh, that that's the idea behind the small reset. So and I love that. Meaning I've had those thoughts and those feelings for myself before as well. You'll hear about the small incremental changes and how those small incremental changes can lead to big outcomes, right? Especially when you're focused and you stay focused on on whatever you're trying to accomplish. So yeah, I just had never thought of it or coined it the small reset before, but I love that. I really love that title. So that's super cool. So I would encourage you uh, folks, if you've, if you found this conversation so far intriguing to go out there and look for the small reset and find Ingo out there on your podcast platform of choice, it'll be uh, a great conversation that I'm sure he's having with a lot of other fantastic folks as well. So as we start to bring this one in for landing, Ingo, I would love to just open up the floor. And is there any other last nugget of wisdom you've shared a ton with us so far today, which I greatly appreciate, but is there anything based on what we've discussed or anything else on your mind that would really be that you feel would be of value uh, for the listener based on the conversation that we've had today? Is there anything going on in your life that you'd like to share? Um, I, I think I just have one last advice, and this is basically what it, it's a quote, actually. So I like to bring this quote because it's something that really resonates with me, and I think it's really true. Um, because it, and it's about happiness, right? And, and, and many people look for for the happiness in the future, as we discussed before, right? If I have the new job, I will be happy, or if I have more money, I will be happy, or if I will have a new wife, I will be happy. And the quote is actually um, says. Happiness is not a destination. It's a place to come from. And that's, I think it's the most important. And I think we should value the present moment. Don't look for any release or any happiness in the future. Just look inside yourself. You will find all the answers in yourself. You will find happiness in yourself and just just be there, just be present. And I think that's that's the most important thing you can do for for 
self improvement or personal development, right? Just to just to be focused more on yourself. And I think that's especially today where you're constantly distracted by all these devices and all this noise around you. I think it's something very important to listen more to the inside rather than to what's what's coming. I agree completely. To your ears and eyes. I agree completely. I actually did that today. Went for a walk before we jumped on this discussion today. Didn't have any devices. Didn't have anything. Just listening to the birds singing. It's been a it's a beautiful sunny day. Watching the trees blow in the wind. You know what I mean? Just trying to take it in. Um, yeah, it's it sounds simple, and it might even sound a little bit strange. But at the same time, if you can really focus on that internal dialogue, the internal what's going on in your surroundings, right? It's uh, happiness comes from within. I love that how you, how you said that there at the very end. So that's, uh, that's fantastic. So Wingo, man, this has been a lot of fun. I knew this was going to be a fun conversation. Uh, we talked about your podcast. We talked about your coaching and, and training that you do with other folks. If uh, people are out there listening, they're like, okay, I need to figure out a little bit more about Ingo and where can I get in contact with him? What are the best places uh, for people to reach out and learn more about you and your services? Yeah. So right now, I, I mean, I have my website. It's the small reset.org. Um, and I'm mainly active on LinkedIn right now. I also have a Twitter profile, uh, but yeah, LinkedIn, Ingo Schulmeier or the small reset.org, I think are the best places. There you will find also a lot of information, all my podcasts, all my, all my talks on other shows and everything that's relevant. So folks, if uh, this conversation has been intriguing to you, if you have or if you've got those feelings of that you just need to make a change, right? You Maybe you're not necessarily finding fulfillment. We talked about fulfillment there at the beginning of the episode in your current life situation. You just know that something needs to happen. That's been very similar. It was very similar for me in my past as well, which is why I was very intrigued to have uh, Ingo on for this conversation. When you have those moments that you know something's got to change, you've got to be willing and able to make those decisions. We talked about decisions today as well. You've got to be able to have a vision of the future. Don't get too caught up in the outcome. Uh, we talked about goals and how you know being so stuck on a certain outcome, how that can derail you from taking the action today needed to move from this, maybe this it's an uncomfortable situation, but you've got to do it. If it's a job that you're not necessarily happy with, Start thinking about having a vision of what it is that you really want, right? Uh, Ingo moved his family halfway across the world, basically, right? Sold his possessions and moved. That's not necessarily the the result or that's not exactly the action that you need to take. But at the same time, if that's calling on you to do that, have some confidence, have some courage, find some people that are, are have done it or that are doing it. Ingo would be a great resource. I'm sure he'd be willing to try to help you through that process. Uh, if you know for a fact that you need to make a change, you're not exactly sure how to do it, Ingo would be your guy. I firmly believe that based on the conversation that we've had here today. So Ingo, man, I appreciate you taking your time this morning to join us here on the Rich Mind Podcast. As I mentioned, I knew this was going to be a fun conversation. I look forward to uh, hearing the feedback from, from the listeners as we uh, get this episode launched. So thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Randy. Yes. So folks, go out there, have a fantastic day. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, share this episode or share the Rich Mind podcast with your family and friends. If you can help me spread the message for anyone that you feel that could use this as it would be valuable in their life, I would greatly appreciate that. Go out there and find Ingo on LinkedIn. You can also go to the smallreset.org and we'll have all those links in the show notes as well for you to get connected with Ingo moving forward. So as I mentioned, go out there, have a fantastic day. I look forward to coming back to you again very soon with a next guest. And until then, have a great day. Bye now. Thank you for joining me on the Rich Mind Podcast. And remember, your external world is a reflection of what's going on inside of you. So focus every day on that internal battle and win within. Until next time, my friends.